All right, welcome to part two. Hopefully you've seen the first part to know that this part of the video here, this video is not going, meant to attack the Mary of the Bible because the Mary of the Bible was a good woman. She was definitely a blessed woman and uh, she is not the Mary of Roman Catholicism. And I'm going to prove that to you in this study. And if you had seen the first part there, you'll notice that the Roman Catholic names for Mary are not in the King James Bible. Uh, nowhere in the King James Bible are the words Mother of God, Mediatrix, Queen of Heaven, although Queen of Heaven is in the King James Bible, but not as a reference to Mary. We're going to talk about that later. Notre Dame. Now, I, I just thought Notre Dame was some kind of a, a college team that has a football thing or something like that, which I hate sports, so I never even care about that stuff. But the fact is, Notre Dame means Our Lady. In French so that's what that thing means so you're going to Notre Dame you're going to you know Mary for education <laughs> or at least the pagan Mary the perpetual virgin not in the King James Bible Queen of the Angels Queen of the May and the Madonna Madonna is also another title for Mary some old paintings and stuff like that of you know this mother of God you know the Madonna so but as I looked up this thing I just thought you know, are there any titles that I'm missing here? So I just kind of did a quick search and uh, on Wikipedia, and they had these different titles for Mary. And down near the bottom, they had a very interesting little section there. Um, here are some other names for Mary that appear in the Quran. The and I'm not even going to try to pronounce these idiotic names. You know, Quanatita or Quanata. Whatever, the Arabic term implies the meaning not only of constant submission to Allah, but also an absorption in prayer and invocation. Sidiqwa, she who accepts as true or she who has faith. The term has also been translated, she who believes sincerely, totally. Sajida, uh, she who prostrates to Allah in worship. Rakaya, um, she who bows down to Allah in worship. Tahira, she who was purified. Mustafia. <laughs> she who is chosen, uh, Nur, Mary has also been called Nut. I'm not making that up. It says it right there, Nut, which means light or um nut. <laughs> the mother of one who was light. And the Mary of, you know, the Quran and the Catholic system here, she is a nut. But uh, Sa Ima, she who fast. Now check this last one out. You want to say, you know, oh, I don't believe that Islam was created by Catholicism. Oh, yeah, it has been. Check this out. Ma Suma, which means she who never sinned. You mean Islam teaches that Mary was a perpetual, immaculate, you know, immaculate conception of Mary? She never sinned? Taught on the Quran. I'm going to show you some more things here about the Quran. So here we have it, the Quran. And uh, first we'll go to the beginning here. And by the way, I'll just show this real quickly here. Many people have asked, you know, if, if I, uh, let me zoom in here so you can read this, where I got these labels. I just printed them up on my computer. This book is for documentation purposes only. It contains many serious errors and lies. Absolute truth can only be found in the King James Bible. Uh, so I put those things in there just, you know, for after the rapture. So nobody gets messed up with this ridiculous nonsense. But here we have uh, the names section. Again, I'll need to zoom in. Here you have this. Isa is the Islamic word for Jesus. And Maryam is the Islamic name for Mary. Now let me show you the interesting thing about that. Here you have contents. And there's all the stuff that this ridiculous fairy tale has in it. And look at that. Chapter 19 of the Quran is a whole chapter dedicated to Mary. Hmm. But I'm sure that they have one, you know, for uh, Isa here, you know, their word for Jesus. I mean, it's got to be in here somewhere. I mean, they, they certainly wouldn't leave out, you know, this, they would call him a great prophet. I'm sure that they wouldn't leave him out of, you know, their holy book here. 
I mean, he's got to be in here somewhere. Huh. You mean to tell me that they would uh, write a holy book and leave Jesus out, but put Mary in? Hmm, interesting. Sounds kind of Catholic to me. Here we have Surah 3, page 32 of this thing. Behold, a woman of Imram said, O my Lord, I do dedicate unto you what is in my womb for your special service. So accept this of me, for you hear and know all things. When she was delivered, she said, O my Lord, behold, I am delivered of a female child. And Allah knew best what she brought forth. And now wise is the male like the female. I have renamed her Mary, and I command, commend her and her offspring to your protection from the evil one, the rejected. Right graciously did her Lord accept her. Uh, he made her grow in purity and beauty. She was assigned to the care of Zechariah. Every time that he entered her chamber to see her, he found her supplied with sustenance. He said, O oh Mary, whence comes this to you? She said, From Allah, for Allah provides sustenance to whom he pleases without measure. Okay, there's another way that you can say this in the original. It goes like this. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. <laughs> which is what uh, Muhammad was. The guy was a lunatic. You know, what a bunch of ridiculous nonsense. But let's continue here. Surah 3, uh, verse 32, I guess. <laughs> Behold, the angel said, O Mary, Allah has chosen you and purified you, chosen you above the women of all nations. She's purified. She's sinless, you know. O Mary, worship your Lord devotely, prostrate yourself and bow down in prayer with those who bow down. This is part of the tidings of the things unseen, which we reveal unto you, O messenger. By inspiration you were not with them when they cast lots with arrows, as to whom, as to which of them should be charged with the care of Mary, nor were you with them when they disputed the point. Behold, the angels said, O Mary, Allah gives you glad tidings of a word from him. His name will be Christ Jesus, the son of Mary. Held in honor in this world and the hereafter and of the company of those nearest to Allah. So he's near to Allah, he's just not, you know, the son of God. This isn't God here. This is a moon deity, a pagan false devil. He shall speak to the people in childhood and in maturity, and he shall be of the company of the righteous. She said, O oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? He said, Even so, Allah creates what he wills. When he has decreed a plan, he but says to it, Be, and it is. And Allah will teach him the book and wisdom the law and the gospel. What is the gospel? <laughs> uh, well, if you're a Muslim, it's you know Catholicism. And if you're a Christian, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, verse 49. And appoint him a messenger to the children of Israel with this message. I have come to you with a sign from your Lord and that I make you of you out of clay as it were the figure of a bird and breathe into it and it becomes a bird by Allah's leave. And I heal those born blind and the lepers and I quicken the dead by Allah's leave. And I declare to you what you eat and what you store in your houses. Surely therein is a sign for you if you did believe. I have come to you to attest the law which was before me, and to make lawful to you part of what was before forbidden to you. I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, so fear Allah and obey him. It is Allah who is my Lord and your Lord, then worship him. This is a way that is straight. Who takes this stuff seriously? I mean... Come on. This is so ridiculous. I mean, it's like it's like written by a little child. It just reminds me of something a little, a little kid would have written. Of course, you know, Muhammad was a perverted little child, so no big surprise. But here you have Surah 19, Mary, the Mary chapter. Miriam, you know. You go over here, Miriam, and it goes down through. We're not going to read all this you know, retarded nonsense, but uh, verse 16, or whatever, 16 here. Relate in the book the story of Mary when she withdrew from her family to a place in the east. She placed a screen to screen herself from them. Then he, we sent to her our angel, and he appeared before her as a man in all respects. She said, I seek refuge from you, refuge from you to Allah, most gracious. Come not near if you fear Allah. He said, Nay, I am only a messenger from your Lord. To announce to you the gift of a holy son. She said, How shall I have a son, seeing that no man has touched me? Am I 
and I am not unchaste. See, she's without sin, perpetual virgin. She's not unchaste. Verse 21, he said, so it will be, your Lord says, this, that is easy for me, and we wish to appoint him as a sign to men, and a mercy from us is a matter so decreed. So she conceived him, and she retired with him to a remote place. And the pains of childbirth drove her to the trunk of a palm tree. She wasn't born, you know, it wasn't Joseph and her, you know, there in the, you know, Basically, the you know, that she lays him in a manger and stuff like that. And she's, you know, no, it's not there. She's not, not like in the stable there. You know, it's just like a, she's under a palm tree. And that palm tree, remember the palm tree. That's going to be important later. Okay? That might not make much sense right now. You might say, a palm tree? Where would you get a palm tree from, you know? That might not make much sense, but it's going to later. Remember the palm tree. Continuing here, she cried in her anguish, Ah, would that I had died before this. Would that I had been a thing forgotten and out of sight. No scripture to back this up, of course, obviously. It's not in the Bible. But a voice cried to her from beneath the palm tree, Do not grieve, for your Lord has provided a rivulet beneath you. And shake toward yourself the trunk of the palm tree. It will let fall fresh ripe dates upon you. I thought uh, coconuts grew on palm trees. Maybe you have a date palm, I guess. But uh, so eat and drink and cool your eye. Huh? Cool your eye? Yeah, you know, a woman's eye really, really gets bothered when she has a child. Yeah. And if you see any man say, I have vowed a, a fast to Allah most gracious, and this day I will enter, not enter into any talk with any human being. Interesting, because the King James does not have the word human in it. At length, she brought the babe to her people, carrying him in her arms. They said, O oh Mary, truly an amazing thing you have brought. O oh sister of Aaron, your father was not a man of evil, nor your mother an unchaste woman. Uh, see the uh, Immaculate Conception here again? Oh boy. But she pointed to the babe. They said, How can we talk to one who is a child in the cradle? Now look at this trick. He said, I am indeed a servant of Allah. He has given me revelation and made me a prophet. And he has made me blessed wheresoever I be and has joined me on prayer and charity as long as I live. So a talking baby Jesus there. He just goes right into preaching, you know, as a newborn baby. Where's Joseph at? Ridiculous nonsense. Now we have the Surah 21, the prophets here. goes down to verse 91. And remember her who guarded her chastity, we breathed into her of our spirit, and we made her and her son a sign for all peoples. She's the co-redeemer, don't you know? According to uh, Catholicism, I mean uh, Islam, no, wait, I do mean Catholicism. Yeah, because Catholicism and Islam are one. Surah 23. The believers. Or, or 50, number 50 here. And we made the son of Mary and his mother as a sign. We gave them both shelter and high ground, on high ground, affording rest and security and furnished with springs. So, there you have a couple quotations from this ridiculous nonsense right here. Showing that they teach that Mary uh, is immaculate. She's sinless. I mean, that's in some of the other traditions and the, all this other, these dumb writings that they come up with. You know, they call her the Masuma, she who never sinned. So they do teach, Islam teaches that she is without sin, exactly as Catholicism teaches. But ironically, the Bible teaches that she was a sinner. She said that she needed God as her Savior, and she sinned. She lied about Jesus in Luke chapter 2. You know, she sinned about that. So Mary was a sinner, but not according to Islam or Catholicism. So, you know, whatever. Next, we're going to go to the First Communion Catechism. So I'm done with this. So 
there. First Communion Catechism. Let's go and see what we have in this fine piece of work. New St. Joseph First Communion Catechism. If you haven't seen this in another video here, you have the Catholic Book Publishing Company. And you have all the official statements there from the Catholic system. So this is not some kind of a, oh, that's not what we believe. You know, I've had Catholics try to duck that thing. But here we have lesson four, the first sins. Was anyone ever free from original sin? The Blessed Virgin Mary was free from original sin. God wanted to free everybody from sin. To do this, he planned to send his son to earth. He wanted his son to have a good mother, so he made the best mother he could. God made Mary. He kept her free from original sin. She came into the world without it. She never had sin. What about Luke chapter 2? Mary's soul was always turned to God. What about Luke chapter 2? Her heart was always full of love for God. She was full of grace. We call this Mary's immaculate conception. Even as a baby, Mary's heart loved God. She grew up loving God. She did not love herself more than God. She wanted only to please God. She always did what God wanted. Uh, okay. Not true. But uh, I want you to notice something else about this um, particular picture here. This is supposed to be Mary's mother. This is supposed to be Mary. What color is her hair? Blonde. Now, I don't know too many Jews that have blonde hair. Pure Jews like Mary would have been. They have dark hair. They're Shemitic people. Shemitic people have dark hair. Like black hair or dark brown hair. They don't have blonde hair. You say, what does this matter? What does this even mean? Oh, well, you're going to see later on that this ties in with the fact that Mary of Catholicism is just the ancient Babylonian Semiramis who was known for her blonde hair. Interesting. But let's continue here. Here you have the love of Jesus destroyed the power of sin. There you have this guy with a triangle behind his head. It's supposed to be God there, I guess. Holy Spirit. And here you have Jesus dying on the cross and Mary helping. Yeah. The love of Jesus was like a fire in his heart. Heartburn. Don't you hate that? Jesus lit the fire in Mary's heart too. This love made Jesus die on the cross for us. This love pleased the Father more than sin displeased him. Sin lost its power to keep us out of heaven. Mary was the co-sufferer, co-redeemer. See? And of course, again, we have this occult thing right here. The nimbus or Aurelia, or Aurora Aurelia, or something, I forget how you say it. But the point is, this symbol of a circular glowing thing around the head of people symbolizes deity, godhood. So Mary is a god. The Holy Spirit, God the Father, Jesus, and Mary. It's not the Holy Trinity, it's the Holy uh, Quad or something like that. I don't know what you'd call it. Four of them. And of course, you know, there you have the love of Jesus open the gates of heaven. Again, you have the Trinity with Mary. <laughs> yeah. Two biggest feasts of the year, Easter Sunday and Pentecost Sunday. Mary in the middle, of course, you know, with her glowing head there again, you know. And again, where's this at in the Bible? You know. Where was Mary the center of the, everything that was going on there? But how about this? Holy Days of Obligation, the Immaculate Conception of December 8th. This feast reminds us how Holy Mary's body and soul were made by God. December 8th. Um, chapter and verse. Where does it say December 8th in here was the day of Mary's birth, the Immaculate Conception? They wouldn't lie, would they? Oh, of course not. Catholics never lie. Keep that in mind, yeah. And on August 15th, you have the Assumption of Mary, the day Our Lady was taken up to heaven. 
Now, I just remember that's in here somewhere. I think uh, it's got to be in the book of Acts shortly after the time of Pentecost and things. That Maybe one of you Catholics out there, if you're still watching by this point, uh, you could let me know where in the book of Acts or any other chapter of the Bible um, Mary is taken up into heaven. I mean, we see the ascension of Jesus Christ over here in Acts chapter 1. You know, Acts chapter 1, it says, uh, verse 10, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. So we see Jesus going up. See, Jesus went up. Here, uh, you have the ascension 40 days after Easter, according to the catechism thing here. But um, a little while later there, uh, you have in August, in the fall there, that uh, Mary went up. So it's got to be in there somewhere. I mean, they certainly it's in there. If you're Catholic, let me know. Keep looking. Search that Bible of yours and let me know when you find it. Next, we're going to go to the Baltimore Catechism, page 143. Here you have the sacraments and prayer. There's Jesus dying on the cross. He's got the special circle, you know, with the little red cross within it there. You know, that's a really special one. And then it comes down to the Eucharist, which you've got to drink to be saved. You drink his blood, you know. Kind of weird why no one ever ran over to him when he was actually on the cross and drank his blood. You know, they could have really been saved good then. But look, it goes down through the hands of Mary with her little Godhead circle there, her special nimbus through the hands of Mary. So, Mary is a necessary part of salvation, according to Catholicism. And me rejecting Mary, I'm sure the Catholics are saying that I'm on my way to hell. In fact, I know they are, because that's Catholic doctrine. Let's continue on. Now we're going to look at this one here. The church teaches from Jesuits. These things put out. Jesuit Fathers of St. Mary's College. The church teaches documents of the church in English translation. Okay, where are we going to start here? Page 160. There, God the Creator and Sanctifier, page 160 says here, as for this concupiscence, which the apostles sometimes call sin, this holy council declares that the Catholic Church has never understood that it is called sin because there is, in the regenerated sin in the true and proper sense, but only because it is from sin and inclines to sin. If anyone thinks the contrary, let him be anathema. What a clear definition for sin. I mean, it's, it's sin, but we don't really think it is sin unless you look at the council. The sin says that we are sinners because of the sin that's mentioned in the Bible is sin. Gee, thank you, holy interpreters of Scripture. What would, what would we do without you? But look what they say here. Okay, you see the definition of sin? Number six here. Nevertheless, the same holy council declares that it is not its intention to include in this decree all on or on original sin, the blessed and immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God, but it declares that the constitutions of Pope Sixtus the Fourth of happy memory are to be observed under the penalties contained in these constitutions, and it renews these penalties here. So in other words, everybody's a sinner except for Mary. Why didn't they include Jesus? Make a mention of Mary, but not Jesus. Say, it's ridiculous. The Catholic Church teaches that Jesus was without sin. Well, then add him into your little statement there. Weird. And I proved to you earlier that Mary did have sin. She lied and she said about God her Savior. Now let's look at number 205 here. The Council of the Lateran, 649. If anyone does not profess according to the Holy Fathers that in the proper and true sense the Holy, ever-Virgin, Immaculate Mary is the Mother of God, since in this last age, not with human seed, but of the Holy Spirit, she properly and truly conceived the Divine Word, who is born of God, the Father, before all ages, and give, 
gave him birth without any detriment to her virginity, which remained inviolable even after his birth, let such a one be condemned. Okay. Um, and by the way, if you want to talk about religious freedom and tolerance and things like that, uh, you should never stand for Catholicism. You see, you aren't going to see other uh, religions and other faiths and things like that. You aren't going to see Bible-believing Christians, I should say it that way, having councils and making official proclamations to condemn people uh, and writing it down as official condemnations. You're condemned by the pages of Scripture if you deny Jesus Christ. But I'm not going to say if you disagree with me on such and such and this and this and that, our official council has condemned you. You know, But notice it says there, inviolable even after his birth that she's a perpetual virgin. But uh, how does that work when she had four sons and at least two daughters? And they're named in the New Testament. How could she be a perpetual virgin when she gave birth to all those children? Kind of weird, isn't it? Okay. And it goes into a bunch of things here. I'll just you can pause that if you want to read that whole thing. We're not going to, um, but it says there that the same most blessed Virgin Mary is not the true Mother of God, and that she did not remain a perfect Virgin before, while, and forever, forever after she gave birth. Again, this thing doesn't work when you compare it to Scripture. When you look at the Bible, you see the Bible overthrows these ridiculous traditions of men and teachings of men. Okay. Here we have, there on the Mother of God, you have uh, the encyclical Mystici Corpus 1943. In the encyclical Mystico Corpus dated June 29th, 1943. See introduction to 239. Pope Pius XII, 1939 to 1958. Pope Pius XII, Pope Pius XII. What was, what was he in history? Um, uh, oh yeah, he was the guy that signed the concordant with Nazi Germany. The fine Christian man that he was. Signing agreements with Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. Well, he's a good guy. I mean, he can make official proclamations. And he is the one, by the way, who made the official proclamation on the Assumption of Mary. See, if she was conceived without sin, if she was immaculately conceived and she was a perpetual virgin, then she couldn't have died because the wages of sin is death. Therefore, if you don't sin, how can you be, how can you die? See? So she would have been, had to have been taken up to heaven. And they made that official proclamation in the 20th century. I'm going to show you about that later too. But let's read this thing here. Um, I'll jump down to here again. You can pause that and read it if you want. It says, Venerable brothers, may the Virgin, mo uh, Virgin Mother of God grant the prayers of our paternal heart, and they are yours too, and obtain for all a true love for the, of the church. Her sinless soul was filled with the divine spirit of Jesus Christ more than all other created souls together. And in the name of the whole human race, she gave her consent for a spiritual marriage between the Son of God and human nature. Within her virginal womb, Christ our Lord already bore the exalted title of head of the church. In a marvelous birth, she brought him forth as source of all supernatural life and presented him newborn as prophet, king, and priest to those who were the first of Jews and Gentiles to come to adore him. Her only son, yielding to a mother's prayer in Cana of Galilee, performed the miracle by which his disciples believed in him. Okay. Free from all sin, original and personal, always most Intimately united with her son, as another Eve, she offered him on Golgotha to the Eternal Father for all the children of Adam, sin-stained in his fall, and her mother's rights and mother's love were included, included, mother's rights and love included in the Holocaust. She's a co-redeemer with Jesus. Thus she, who corporally was the mother of our head, through the added title of pain and glory, became spiritually the mother of all his members." You're not just a member of the body of Christ. You are a member of Mary as well. She's the head of, of the church, apparently. 
She it was who through her powerful prayers obtained the grace that the spirit of our divine Redeemer already given to the church on the cross should be bestowed anew through miraculous gifts on the newly founded church of, on Pentecost, bearing with courage and con confidence the tremendous burden of her sorrows and desolation, truly the queen of martyrs, she more than all the faithful filled up what is lacking of the sufferings of Christ for his body, which is the church. You dirty, rotten, filthy, stinking, hypocritical liars, you. The Roman Catholic whore were the ones that killed the martyrs of Jesus. So how can you have Mary of Catholicism being the queen of the martyrs when she's the one that killed the martyrs? Disgusting. She continued to show for the mystical body of Christ born from the pierced heart of the Savior, the same mother's care and ardent love with which she clasped the infant Jesus, Jesus, infant Jesus to her warm and nourishing breast. Yeah, we're going to talk more about that later too. The bull. Yeah, we've been reading a lot of bull. Uh, whatever all that says. Deus, Deus, Deus uh, 1950. On November 1st, 1950, Pope Pius the Nazi the 12th defined the assumption of the Blessed Virgin into heaven as a dogma of faith. Leaving the dispute about whether or not Mary died an open question, the Pope responded to the petitions of the bishops and priests and faithful by giving honor to the Blessed Virgin with a solemn definition. The assumption of the Blessed Virgin body and soul into heaven is another of the great privileges conceded to her by God for consenting to be His mother, the mother of God. Uh, you're going to find that in Scripture. Okay, the universal church, which uh, uh, excuse me, the universal church in which the Spirit of Truth dwells, and which He infallibly guides to perfect knowledge of revealed truths, has shown its faith many times in the course of the centuries. Bishops from all over the world, with almost perfect unanimity, have petitioned that the truth of the corrupt corporal uh, assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary into heaven be defined as a dogma of the divine Catholic faith. Now check this out: the truth of this dogma is based on sacred scripture. Really? Please give me the chapter and verse. Any of you Catholics out there, chapter and verse, please. Give me the scriptures that tell me where this sacred dogma is at. Show me. I'll be waiting. And is deeply rooted in the hearts of the faithful, not mine. It is sanctioned by the worship of the church, and from the most ancient, from the most ancient times, it is completely consonant with all other revealed truths. No, it isn't. It has been explained and proclaimed by the study, the knowledge, and the wisdom of theologians. In consideration of all these reasons, we judge that in God's providence, uh, the time has come to proclaim solemnly this wonderful privilege of the Virgin Mary. We therefore, after humbly and repeatedly praying to God and calling upon the light of the Spirit of Truth for the glory of Almighty God, which has shown great and particular love for the Virgin Mary, for the honor of His Son, the King of immortal ages and the conqueror of sin and death, for the increase of the glory of His Great Mother, for the joy and exaltation of the whole Church by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, of the blessed Apostles Peter and Paul, and by... You gotta love this. Our own authority. Yeah, that's all you have in actuality. To pronounce, declare, and define as a divinely revealed dogma, the Immaculate Mother of God, Mary, ever virgin, after her life on earth, was assumed body and soul to the glory of heaven. Then you get into the veneration of the saints there. But the, the fact of the matter is, it says the truth of this dogma is based on sacred scripture. Nowhere in the Bible are you going to find Mary being called up to heaven. Not one reference to it. Back here under the topical index, you can see all these other things here. You know, Mary, the mother of God, uh, mother of Christ is in the proper and true sense, mother of God. She was a virgin and always remained a virgin. No, she did not. She was conceived without original sin. That's a lie. Remain free from all sin. Another lie. 
surpassing all other saints in holiness? I don't think so. She is the mediatress of all graces. All graces? For by grace are you saved? She is the mediatress of all graces? Who is salvation through? You say Jesus Christ. Oh, no, no, no. Mary. Mary is the mediator of all graces. And co-redemptress with, with Christ. She has been gloriously assumed into heaven, body, and soul. Mary is the mother of the mystical body. Not my opinions. Not uh, me being hateful and, uh, you know, hate criminal and whatever else. Right there from a Jesuit book, the church teaches. Right there. Based on the Council of Trent and on many of these other councils and things like that. This is what Catholicism believes. And you better watch out for all this ecumenical stuff because they'll lie to people and say, oh, no, we work, we're good with the way you believe and we're cool with the way you believe and stuff like that. Ah, no, you don't have to believe exactly like we do. You can just come be part of it and stuff. Uh-huh, sure. And then you get in there and they say, you know, you're going to believe what we believe or you're going to die. We're going to torture you like they've done for centuries. Next, we have the actual catechism here of the Catholic Church. Okay, the official one. We're going to go here to number 829. But while in the most blessed virgin, the church has already reached that perfection whereby she exists without spot or wrinkle, the faithful still strive to conquer sin and increase in holiness. And so they turn their eyes to Mary. In her, the church is already the all-holy. Wait a second here. The faithful still strive to conquer sin and increase in holiness. So they turn their eyes to Mary? Uh, no, I turn my eyes to Jesus Christ, the one mediator between God and men. You vile, blasphemous, stinking Catholics, you. And if you don't believe this, is you say, oh, I don't believe that, I'm a Catholic, I don't believe that, then you better get out of it. You better get saved and you better get out of this satanic system of Roman Catholicism. It's disgusting. I turn my eyes to Mary to, to purify my sins. Then you're on your way to hell. Mary couldn't save a sick cat or a sick Catholic for that matter either. You're not going to find that stuff in the Bible. It's not in there. Totally disgusting. But I want you to notice here this little footnote there. You jump down here to the footnotes and it says Ephesians 5, 26 through 27. Okay? It says there that, you know, whoop, uh, she exists without spot or wrinkle. Okay? So let's look at what Ephesians 5, verses 26 and 27 says. Ephesians 5, verse 26 and 27. That He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that He might present it to Himself, a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And by the way, I don't know of any Bible version out there that would say she. Of course, there might be one. You know, Satan is certainly busy cranking them things out. But the fact of the matter is, you have the catechism saying Mary is the head of the church. Mary is the one that you look to to be holy. And you have the Bible, the Word of God. Let me put this actually in my left hand. Matthew chapter 25, if you know about that. Word of God says he, Jesus Christ, is the head of the church. This satanic Catholic catechism says Mary, she is the head of the church. They can't both be right. If you're over here, you're lost. If you're over here, you're saved. You can't have it both ways. But you say, what about this thing of the blonde-haired Mary? You, you mentioned that. I don't know about this. You know, what about this thing of the blonde-haired Mary? Well, we're going to go to RestoredTraditions.com. Going to get on the internet here, and I'm going to show you that Catholicism, for centuries, their artists have been painting blonde-haired Marys. And you can say, well, that's just an artist interpretation. There are blonde-haired ones. There are, there are brunette ones, like Mary would have been. Um, but 
if that was true, that it was just the artist interpretation, then the Catholic Church should have corrected it and said, wait a second here, um, Mary was a Jew, therefore she would have had black hair or dark brown hair. They should have condemned this thing of the blonde-haired Mary. But you're going to see why, when we come back from the internet there, you're going to see why they don't condemn it and why it's so important that they have a blonde-haired Mary. So let's go to the internet now. I'm going to show you some paintings that the Catholic system that they used to depict Mary with blonde hair. All right, here we are at Restored Traditions. It's a Catholic website, and they sell these different paintings of Mary and, and other saints and things like that. And so we're going to look at a couple of these. First, we have here the Annunciation by... Carl Heinrich Bloch, and you say, is Mary blonde? She looks blonde to me. Right there, and of course you have this weird sexless winged angel doing the devil salute thing there. Crazy. Then you have this one here, and uh, by the way, the first one there was a little bit before 1890, pre-1890s is when that one was, was painted. This one here was printed in the early, or painted in the early 1300s. And Mary has blonde hair again. And of course the occult nimbus around her head. But early 1300s. Hmm. Interesting. And then go to this one here, The Annunciation by Leonardo da Vinci. And there you have this weird, winged, sexless, supposed angel doing the satanic salute again. Interesting because the Antichrist comes with a bow, carrying a bow, which is like the what he's doing there with his fingers. You shoot the bow with two fingers. But let's look at Mary. Oh, Mary has blonde hair again. Shouldn't the uh, Catholic system be rejecting this and saying this is wrong and evil and everything, that Mary didn't have blonde hair? Well, because, as we'll see later in the study, there's a reason why this Mary has blonde hair. And by the way, the Da Vinci painting right there uh, was from 1475 to 1480. That's when that thing was painted. Okay, now we have, next we'll go to the Annunciation by Poussin, I guess is how you say that. Blonde hair yet again weird being with the uh, blue or blue and orange wings there or whatever. Yeah, but again a blonde haired Mary. Hmm. Interesting. And then Annunciation by Wyden, Wyden, I'm sure how you pronounce that. Blonde haired Mary again. And of course you gotta love how they depict these you know, Mary is poor, but she's got this fabulous bedroom and all this nice stuff, you know. Sure. And that's in 1440 is when this one was painted. Next we'll go to the Betrothal of the Virgin by Raphael. Uh, hair doesn't look really blonde, but it's definitely not black hair, like a, a Jew would have had. That's 1504 when that one was painted. Then we'll go to the... Whoa, what is this? The Burial of Virgin Mary and Reception of Her Soul in Heaven. The Burial? Well, I thought she was uh, assumed up into Heaven. The Assumption of Mary. Well, this is painted back in... Uh, 1435 before they knew about the uh, Assumption of Mary. Kind of funny. 1950 is when the Assumption of Mary became official Catholic doctrine, so back then the Catholics were still painting that Mary died. Hmm. Isn't it interesting? Now we'll go to the next page. Show you a couple more here. Okay, this is a pretty famous one here, the Coronation of the Virgin Mary. Now see, there she's got dark hair, but look at her skin. See, she doesn't look very Jewish to me, you know. 
But see, you'll have this. You'll have Mary sometimes with blonde hair, Mary sometimes with dark hair. Uh, why the confusion? Shouldn't the Catholic system be a little bit more careful about that? How about the... Uh, let's see here, the Immaculate Conception by Rennie. Mary with blonde hair. Again, Mary with blonde hair. This time, though, she's riding on a Pringles potato chip and smashing three little kids' heads underneath it with wings on them or something. <laughs> uh, weird Catholics. Um, Immaculate Conception uh, by Rubens. Now, this one is very blasphemous. Oh, and by the way, this other one up here, 1627. The coronation is 1641. Look at this one. Oh, Blonde-haired Mary yet again. But check this out. She is crushing the serpent's head, uh, which is a blasphemous perversion of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where it says about the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head, and it shall bruise his heel. It's not Mary that crushes the serpent's head. It's the seed of the woman, the man. Interesting. So they have Mary here basically being the prophesied Messiah that would come and destroy Satan. Hmm. Little bit blasphemous there, don't you think? Next page. Let's see. Madonna and child enthroned with the two angels. There you have the blonde Mary again. And blonde angels too, that's good. And then you got this funny looking little fat baby here. His face kind of reminds me of Alex Jones in a way, you know. This is like the birth of Alex Jones or something here. Kind of weird. But uh, then we'll go to Madonna and Child in Glory by Sasso Ferretto or something. Blonde haired Mary again. Hmm. And a blonde haired Jesus too. That's a neat trick. Madonna and Child 4 by Sasso Ferretto. The same guy. Mary with blonde hair. Huh. Another one here. Madonna and Child Jesus by Botticelli. It's kind of orangish blonde hair, I guess, this time, but uh, still, uh, she doesn't look like a Jew to me. And we'll just kind of skim down through here, look at a couple more. Madonna of Humility. Blonde hair. Bizarre little things above her there. But blonde hair again. And of course I'm doing this for those Catholics out there that, that oh, I've never heard of a Mary with blonde hair. There you go, another one. By Botticelli again. The Magnificat, they're, they're crowning her, you know. On the next one, again you have, you know, some of these things. There you have blonde hair and the old occult nimbus around her head. you have the Madonna of the Wheat. Long blonde hair. Hmm. And of course there's a whole bunch more there. This famous one of Mary when she was supposedly a little child. Little blonde girl. Sure. 
right, with Christ, child, and singing angels. It's always funny, these, all these merry women in the paintings, they always look like they're high on drugs or something. They're always like half out of it. Which I guess would be true if you're the witchcraft queen. And there you have uh, Mary, the queen of heaven. This time she's got dark hair, but you know, yep, the queen of heaven. Got this weird little flaming heart candle <laughs> with a sword sticking in it. And just a couple more pages to go here. Again, you can look at these in more detail if you want to go to this website. And see how ridiculous things are. You know, you can see blonde type hair there again. Another one here where it's very, very blonde, almost golden in color. You know? If anybody ever tells you, you know, oh, there's no proof that Catholics ever considered Mary as having blonde hair. Oh, they just don't know what they're talking about. Right there it is again. Virgin of Humility with blonde hair. You know, and this is spanning hundreds and hundreds of years when these Catholic artists are painting these things. You know, what do you do with that if you're a Catholic? 